Morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to all City Lights, City Lights friends, City Lights family members. Uh, good to be gathering together again as we have become, has become our habit. Uh, Romans encourages us not to forsake gathering together as some are in the habit of doing. I think what it's talking about is don't stop gathering together in churches and, and in venues on Sundays and uh, don't stop meeting in life groups and in home groups. I think that's what it's referring to. Uh, build a habit of doing that and don't stop doing that as some people have fallen out of the habit of doing that. Uh, well, for us, that means a completely different thing at the moment. We are not stopping gathering together. Well, we are. We're not gathering in our normal venue, but we, we're not stopping to gather together. We're gathering together in this way. And so it really is a great joy to be together again. It's a great uh, joy to and privilege to be able to preach to you this morning and to be able to share God's word and hopefully encourage you uh, as you work through the season and as you seek God um, in all that he's doing. So yeah, wonderful to be together and, uh, and God bless you all. Just a couple of things I wanted to mention to you. Um, one was uh, that that I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear if you feel like there's anything uh, that we are doing that we don't need to do or anything that we are not doing that you feel like maybe we should do or something, anything that we're doing that you'd like to see us do more of. Uh, I'd love to get uh, some feedback from you as the church uh, from your perspectives and where you are. We're all disconnected and so there's no, not a lot of conversation going on. Um, but I'd love to hear from that. So just please send me some feedback if you'd like to be hearing more messages, if you'd like to be getting more contact from us, if you would like to be uh, getting more, more phone calls or, or encouraged, if you feel like we should be doing some things. And by that, by we, I mean all of us. I don't mean me uh, necessarily, but if you feel like as, as a church, we, we, we could, be, could be devoting ourselves to more um, than, than what we're currently doing, please let me let me know. I'd love to hear. The other thing is just uh, want to say that I'm praying for you, uh, for you in particular in the areas of finances at this time. I know that we're coming into the end of the month now, and this could be a tough end of the month. Many of you won't be getting salaries. Some of you will be getting reduced salaries. Some of you will be getting the same salary you've always got. Um, I'm just praying for you and we want to be praying for one another in this time uh, that we will be able to steward what we have very, very well. And that we would always remember that we serve a God who is able to do a lot with very little. Uh, and so take what you have, receive it with joy. Uh, the little you have, even if it is very little, surrender it to the Lord and receive it with joy and pray and trust in the Lord with all your heart. He will give you all that you need and even an increase in an abundance for you to be able to be generous. So we're praying for you in the area of finances and trusting that the Lord is leading and guiding and that you're feeling and, and enjoying feeling his provision uh, right now at this time. Brilliant. Well, we've gathered to, to the Word. Hopefully you've had some time to pray. You've spent a little bit of time in worship, and now we're into the Word section. So let's dive in. Today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to be uh, speaking out of verses 19 to verse 30. So we'll read those together. And uh, Philippians 2, verses 19 to 30, I'll read it for you and with you. And, uh, and then I'm going to preach a little bit of what God's put on my heart for us this morning. So let's go for it. Uh, Paul writing, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all, and he has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. 
I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died in the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Now, Lord, I pray that you would enrich our lives, enrich our hearts, shape us and teach us by your spirit and through your word this morning. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. So Philippians chapter 2, the book of Philippians is a letter from the Apostle Paul. The background to this section that we're going to look at today is Paul is a prisoner and he's writing a letter back to the church that he once visited. A man called Epaphroditus has been sent from the church to help Paul. Epaphroditus was sent to Paul uh, with a financial gift. Uh, that the church had gathered for him and also he was sent to Paul as a gift himself. Uh, Paul was under house arrest and so he needed for other people to help him with all sorts of things, a little bit like we do right now. Uh, all the, the, the many things of life Paul needed assistance with and so Epaphroditus went with a financial gift and he also, he was there to help. I love how this resonates with us today, this thing about churches helping other people, this thing about financial gifts being gathered in order to be sown and used as a blessing uh, beyond the church, this thing about a servant of God, Epaphroditus in this case, uh, traveling and going as the hands and feet of the whole church. He was their representative, their messenger, their their. Uh, he was fulfilling what they couldn't do themselves because they couldn't all go. I love how it resonates with a, with a lot of what's going on in our lives at the moment. Um, it's undeniably for us an unusual time. It was for them too. And we need to figure out in this time what is needed and we need to find our fit. That's individual and for the church. Uh, this is a time to reorganize some things and to discover where the needs are and how we can serve them as Epaphroditus did, as the church in Philippi did, as Paul did, as we read, as Timothy did. Those are the three characters. Paul adjusted his ministry uh, from visiting churches. Uh, he used to travel and visit churches and sit one on one with people. He adjusted his ministry in this time from visiting churches to and, and people to writing letters. The Philippians here, they they adjusted their budgets to make contributions to send to Paul. They gave over and above what they had been previously doing. And we are doing similar, aren't we? We're, we are adjusting and working out what is required in this time. And we're giving ourselves to that. We're constantly asking, what do we need to do? How can we serve? How can we show love? How can we be the church in the scenario, in the context that we're in right now? Because it's different to what it was two months ago. And it, it might be different in the future. So just as, as this scenario uh, was presented to the Philippines, Philippian church and to Paul and to his followers, we have these scenarios to deal with ourselves. Maybe we need to give towards a financial fund that can be used locally, or maybe it can be used with, with, within the church. Maybe we need to carry gifts to others like Epaphroditus. I'm hearing that that's happening. We're sending gifts out, and then those gifts are going beyond where we send them to as the people we send them to take them generously to other people. They don't use them all for themselves. It's just an amazing time, and we've had to work this out. And in many ways, we're still working all of this out for ourselves. Maybe we need to become people who will carry the gifts to others. Maybe we need to be the people who receive the gift, like Paul. Uh, Paul said, I'm in no need of anything, but actually he did have needs, and he did need to, he did need Epaphroditus to come and help him, and he did need to, he did need the financial um, blessing that was, was, was given to him. At this time, he couldn't work. He couldn't do what he would normally do to to meet his own needs. And so he did have needs. And so Paul needed to perhaps humble himself and receive the gift from the church. And that as, as much as the church needed to recognize that Paul was in need. And if they didn't meet his need, it might go unmet. Uh, these are difficult times. These are strange times for them, for us right now. And uh, we want to look at all of these things for ourselves. 
uh, what we do, how we respond to this time, the part we play, well, that'll look different for all of us. Why? Well, because God's called us differently and God's resourced us differently and he's equipped us differently. And so I want to encourage you to give prayer. I want to encourage you to give consideration about where you are at this current time and about what God is calling you to do. And I'd love to speak about that with you and, and dialogue with you on that. So let's do that again. Let's do that in the week and in the weeks to come as we build uh, a testimony of the grace of God during during this time. But anyway, back to our text. <laughs> uh, there's a lot for us here. There's, there's a lot to see. And, and I'm calling this talk Humility, Frailty, and Accountability. Humility, Frailty, and Accountability. Mostly because these are the three qualities that I've gleaned out of what is here. Uh, and I think that these qualities are represented to us here for us to replicate. I don't think that this is just a historical account that is in Scripture for us to see kind of what the dynamics and movements are, were for people. I think it's there to build our faith. I think it's there to encourage, encourage us, move us, and motivate us. Certainly, I felt encouraged, moved, and even motivated by what I've seen in Timothy, Paul, Epaphroditus, and in the qualities that come through in, in the actions and the way that they they serve. Uh, what I mean by replicate, what I mean is that we should see uh, these things, these qualities and characteristics as worship glorifying to God. Uh, and we should ask the Holy Spirit to produce them as fruit in our lives. We see them in them. We would love for them to be in us because they truly are glorious. They are truly wonderful. And they are truly not out of the nature of man, but rather they are out of the work of the Spirit within these godly men and so and, and these followers of Jesus. And so our hearts, our hearts need to need to turn to, to God and say, God, would you create in me these hearts, these things that we see in these in these men. These are characteristics and qualities of New Testament followers of Jesus. Uh, we see them in the, this earliest uh, church, church, but uh, they truthfully are, are also in us. These are characters and qualities of people who came closely behind Jesus himself. And these are some of the things that God did in these guys that helped them to grow and to be those people who advanced the gospel. It was because of some, because of who they were, were because of how how their hearts had been shaped by God, that they lived the way they did, and the way they lived translated into the gospel uh, being carried to nations and churches being planted. So uh, let's let's have a look at them: humility, frailty, and accountability. And we see these in Timothy, Epaphroditus, and Paul. Uh, and uh, I'm going to help you, hopefully, help you to see see what I can see. Let's start with humility, verses 19 to 20. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned, genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with the father, he has served me and the gospel. Timothy's attitude here is amazing. The way Paul talks about Timothy says something about Paul, but the way the things Paul says about Timothy says something about Timothy. Timothy is not the same as the others, Paul said. The others seek their own interests, but not, not Timothy. Not Timothy. Timothy is humble in that sense. He's not going after his own gain. He's not going after his own agenda and his own interest. He's, he's going after Paul's agenda and interest or Christ's agenda and interests. Um, he's genuinely, Paul says, genuinely concerned for others. Not just concerned. He's got a, oh, he asked about you or, or he, he kind of he's kind of concerned for you. No, not that at all. Genuinely concerned for others. And in particular here, the Philippian church. What a great characteristic. The humility of Timothy has set him free for cons of concern for himself and, and, and a protectionism of his, of his own self, has set him free from serving and trying to, trying to self-promote himself and has 
allowed him to serve Paul, the ministry of Jesus Christ, and also the church of Jesus in, in, in Philippi. It's allowed him to become, to lose himself, if you like, in the mission of Jesus. He's genuinely concerned for others. Timothy has taken on a, a, a gospel-centered humility. Uh, and, and it's, so, it, it, it's, it's so easy for us to put ourselves first. But when we start to follow Jesus, we stop doing that. The work of the Spirit in us stops us doing that. We begin to humble ourselves and we be, begin to put Jesus' interests first. Timothy was humble. He put Jesus first, which meant to him having a great concern for others. One of the ways to embrace the gospel and to work the gospel out is to have a great concern for others. And I just love this church because I understand, I see your dialogues between one another. I see your work and generosity to others. And the great concern that we have and that you have for others is, is truly uh, glorifying, truly worship to God. Uh, for Timothy, being humbly and having a grateful concern for others meant that he served Paul. He served the gospel and he put the Philippian church ahead of himself, carrying a great concern. What for? For their welfare, for their well-being. He was concerned that they were equipped, that they were well positioned, that they were receiving all that they, they ought to be receiving uh, of the grace of God as they walked out in, in, in faith. In him, he wanted them to thrive. Timothy was humble. He wanted to lay his life down and surrender himself that they would thrive. In being with Paul or traveling to Philippi, Timothy wasn't seeking self fulfillment. This wasn't his a task that he had to do. This wasn't a job with a promise for personal reward. Uh, Timothy had a genuine concern, a concern for them, a concern for the church for their benefit and not for his own benefit. This is a mark of the church, a mark, friends, of humility, a concern for others and their benefit above our, above our own. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit shape our hearts to be like Christ's and to be like Timothy's. This is the work of the Spirit in the gospel-centered people that we are. The wor world needs, to hu needs humble men who will carry genuine concern for the church. Men and women who look to the welfare of others and not to their own. Our bent is to move inward. And so I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will train our hearts and will turn them to humility. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so we long to offer not ourselves, but Christ as glorious. The next thing we see, the next characteristic we see is, is in, in, in the next character of this text. And it's a man called Epaphroditus. And one I want to speak about in Epaphroditus was his adaptability. So we see adaptability a little bit in Timothy. Timothy adapted himself to, to be the man and he allowed Christ to work in him. But, but let's look at Epaphroditus. He's, he's a Greek convert. Uh, he's, he was part of the Philippian church and was either a volunteer or he was a chosen delegate, which means that he's in this church. He's enjoying himself. Maybe his family's in the church. Maybe he's got a girlfriend in the church. Uh, uh, he's lived in the city. He, he, he Perhaps he has a job or perhaps he's got dreams of being a, an elder or a leader e even in the church. I'm not sure what Epaphroditus' track was, but he, he, things were going on in his life. And, uh, and then this issue of, of Paul being in prison, this crisis arose and it needed some response. And so the elders of the church perhaps began to discuss and they said, well, let's gather some, some, some finances and see if people will give towards this cause. And, and people did. They opened their hearts and gave towards Paul. And then they said, well, who are we going to have to take uh, this money there? And you know what? If the guy's going to go all the way there, I wonder if we could, if there's somebody who will not only take it there, but who will also stay there while with Paul for a while and just serve him and help him. That can be our contribution as a whole church. We can send the money and we can send. But who could it be? Who, who will go for us? Who will, who will this man be? Uh, and maybe, maybe they selected Epaphroditus. 
My feeling is that they didn't select Epaphroditus at all, but that he volunteered. And I, I say that just on in conjecture. Philippi was a military city. It, was, it had a military culture. It had a, a mission culture. Military men go on missions. They, they, need, they want to fight battles. They want to fight wars. They want to uh, win victories. And, uh, and they're happy to do that at the expense of themselves. And, and my sense is that, is that with all this military culture in the, in the city, it was probably in the heart of some of the young men. And so when this opportunity arose to, to go on a journey, which was probably going to be dangerous, holding on to the money as he was, but to go on to the journey and then to spend time in a, in a foreign place and serve uh, serve the church by going. Uh, when that opportunity came, I, I reckon Epaphroditus jumped and volunteered. So I'm, I'm thinking he put his hand up for that. He said, I, I'm your man. And, uh, and I don't think he would have put his hand up lightly. I don't think he would have done it without thought. Um, this, is, this was a tough journey, but Epaphroditus did it anyway. What, a, what an incredible picture. A young man on track, going somewhere, doing some things, but then, then being willing and, 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 and able to be adaptable and to change into uh, a different direction, to take a different direction. Epaphroditus had this home and family, but he was willing to adapt, to change his focus, to serve the need that was presenting itself and to serve the unexpected crisis that somebody else was facing. Friends, we need adaptable people who will do hard or inconvenient things on behalf of the church. We need adaptable people who will set aside what they are doing to serve others. We need the gospel to go out on the feet of adaptable people because throughout scripture, that's what we see. People who were prepared to embrace change, people who were prepared to see the need and run towards it were the people that it, that, that, that most, most, most likely were the people that carried the gospel and that shared the gospel and that, 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 that broke new ground in, in, in lives and, and in cities. Epaphroditus was bold and he was courageous in adapting and in volunteering. It wasn't all easy going though. Epaphroditus ended up getting sick. Sick almost to the point of death, we read in verse 26. Often for us in our culture, perhaps especially with men, often when we, we, we have issues, uh, we have an issue ourselves, that issue becomes a reason. It becomes for us even a reasonable reason uh, or an excuse for us to worry about us and not about others. And so we might even be on, a, on, on our way having decided, but then something comes up and, uh, and it... And it and it distracts us and it, it, it drags us back and, and we don't, we don't push, push through. Um, the thing that we, we can replicate mostly in our lives that we see in the life of Timothy and in the life of Epaphroditus is their concern for others that was greater than themselves, but also how that caused them to adapt to live away from themselves rather than towards themselves. So often, if I get sick, for example, uh, everything becomes about me. I don't know if that's the same for other people. I don't know if it's the same just for guys and not for girls or ladies, but that's the way it is. The minute things, things get hard, if I've got resources and finances, then, then I'm, I find it easy to live outwardly. But when things, when my resources become limited, I begin to very quickly be, be concerned for what I have and what I don't have. And, and my gaze for the outward becomes, becomes inward. I begin to live uh, towards myself rather than away from myself. And so I ebb and flow according to, according to what I have. But we don't see that with Epaphras, Epaphroditus or with, with Timothy or with Paul, for that matter. They, they seem to have adapted their lives to living away from themselves rather than towards themselves, even when they themselves are in need. And that's incredible. I find that incredible in them. I want to learn from them and I want what they had. I want the Holy Spirit to put in me what he put in them. Because this is the mark of the early followers of Jesus, of the early church that looked to Jesus. They looked like Jesus. They looked like Jesus because they looked to Jesus. And Jesus himself lived away from himself, not towards himself. 
and Epaphroditus stuck it out. He made the trip. He served Paul like a brother. He got sick and nearly died, but he's still there. He's still there. And now Paul's writing about, hey, I'm going to send him back. But he's still there. He stuck it out until, uh, and to, together with Paul, they decided that he should go home. And friends, this is my prayer, that the Holy Spirit would shape my heart and that he would shape your heart to be like Jesus who left heaven to walk on this earth, who adapted to life on earth, who, who adapted to, to resisting temptation and rejection, uh, and, and, and who did all of that not for his own sake, but for our sakes. Do you see how Timothy and Epaphroditus were actually imitating Jesus? And when we imitate these men, Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus, we're, also, we're, we're actually imitating Jesus, the beautiful character and nature of of our Christ. I pray that that the Holy Spirit would shape our hearts like he shaped Epaphroditus's heart. That we would be willing at every turn to drop what we're doing in order to volunteer to serve and to do whatever needs doing, even if it means risk to ourselves, even if it means that, uh, that we may get sick along the way, and that we would be able to stick it out. I pray that the Holy Spirit would help us to be persistent, people who stick it out, and that we will know if it's time or when it's time to stop and return and take up a new mantle, take up a new role. I pray that God would make us all like Epaphroditus. Paul tells us more about Epaphroditus, more godly characters in, in the way he describes him. He says he lived like a brother, which means that he lived with deep affection, deep love for Paul. And they lived together like that. Uh, he worked like a fellow worker. So, so he came alongside Paul and he didn't just work as a servant. He, they worked together. Epaphroditus did what Paul did and they, and they worked together. They made, he made Paul's work his own. Uh, he says he was a soldier, uh, which wonderful language that the Philippians would have understood meant he was sacrificial and he was even willing to die. In, in service of Jesus and in service of the mission and ministry that the church had given to him and sent him on. What an ama amazing uh, description of a man, a brother, a fellow worker, a soldier uh, willing to die. And then in verse 30, we see Paul describe him not directly, but indirectly in a different way. And this is, uh, just jump on this one quickly because I love this one. Uh, in verse 30, we see that Paul describes him as a gambler. Now, not a gambler that goes to a casino, of course, but a gambler who was prepared like a soldier to risk. Paul says that, he uses this word risk. He says in verse 30, risking his life to complete was what was lacking in your service to me risking his life. So what he's saying is that Timothy was, was adaptable to the degree of not even living defensively as we all tend to do, but rather living liberally with his life, risking his life. He put it all on the table to serve Jesus, to serve the mission, to serve the opportunity that he had in, in serving Paul. Friends, sometimes it costs something. Sometimes it might cost something. Sometimes God gives us opportunities and we, we opportunities stand before us. And, uh, and, and many of us miss those opportunities because, well, why? We're not, we're not prepared really to risk. We weigh it up. We count the cost. It's not always a bad thing to do, but we count the cost. And then we say, oh, just there's not enough certainty here for me. But what Paul says about Timothy here is very telling. And I, I'm, I'm moved by it. He says he was a gambler risking his life. He completed what was lacking in your service to me. There's no certainty in, in, in his service. There's only hope. Epaphroditus went with hope that he would live through this, that he would, he would make it all the way to Paul. He'd be able to hand over the money and that he would, he would, he would live through whatever he encountered on the journey. There's no certainty, friends. Epaphroditus gambled his whole life. He was all in and he held nothing back. And this is the kind of people Paul is lifting up to the church, Timothy, Epaphroditus, these, these great men who did great things 
and he's saying, look at them and, and, and be like them. Uh, embrace the character and characteristics you see in them. At one time, there was a plague in Carthage and many people were becoming sick and they were dying and the church cared for the people in the city. It wasn't this time, but it was a time before. And, and the church had cared and looked after. They, they dug graves and they buried the dead and they looked after the sick and, uh, and, and at, at great risk to themselves. And these people were known as gamblers for Christ. And this is where we understand this, this term of risking his life. Risking is saying, I'll no longer protect my life by running away from what I could be running into. Or saying, when I, or staying when I could be going. Risking is not saying I'm going to stay when I could be going. Or it's not holding on when I could be releasing. If Epaphroditus was adaptable, he ran into opportunities at risk to himself. He served those opportunities. He partnered strong. He, he like Timothy, set, off, set aside his own agenda for other agendas, for Christ's great agenda. He was adaptable. He changed his whole life. He risked for the glory of Jesus. Friends, that is worship. That is worship. And then finally, we get to frailty and, and we get to Paul. And, and it's interesting to talk about frailty and Paul because we always think of Paul as this great apostle. And of course, he is the great apostle. But Paul recognized his frailty. He was a great apostle, but he recognized his frailty. And, and later we're going to see how his recognition of his frailty also enabled him to recognize other people's frailty and to honor them in spite of it. So let's have a look here. You say, how does Paul recognize his frailty? Well, here we go. He writes this, that I may be cheered. He's admitting that he's sad here and he's wanting something happy to happen to cheer him, to, to, to encourage him. He writes that I may be less anxious. Isn't that interesting? That I may be less anxious. So he's showing us that not only is he sad, but he's also anxious. So he gets anxiety sometimes. And then he writes, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So what's he saying there? What's he feeling? Lest I have sorrow upon sorrow. I'm, I'm going to send Paul back, uh, Epaphroditus back to you. Lest I have sorrow upon more sorrow. I don't want him dying here because I'm already in a tough situation. I'm already experiencing sorrow. And this will be sorrow on top of that. He's admitting to feeling sorrow. Paul in his humanity, friends, is also frail. He's sad, he's anxious, he has sorrow, and he's also prone to fear. His fears having of having more, he fears having more sorrow on top of the sorrow that he already has. Friends, Paul was frail. He was fragile. Sting song, sings a wonderful song called Fragile and speaks of how fragile we are, how fragile we are. And we are. And Paul and Paul was too, but he didn't try to hide it, nor did he seek pity for it. Friends, this is a character, characteristic that we also need to understand and learn to, to imitate or allow the Holy Spirit to, to, to teach us to imitate. Not that we should force frailty and become frail and make ourselves frail, but that we acknowledge frailty, our own frailty, with one another. That's the characteristic, the acknowledging of frailty. Too many times and too many of us are hiding our frailty, hiding weaknesses, hiding hurts and, and, and sadnesses. Instead, we need to recognize them. And, we, and, and when we recognize them, we, we, need, we, 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 we rob them of their, of their power. And so recognize them and in, doing, in, in recognizing, rob them of their power. We can't allow frailty to move us from Christ-centered to me-centered. Although that's often what frailty does. It moves us from how oh, I'm looking at Jesus and then all of a sudden I start feeling weakness. I feeling, start feeling sorrow. I start feeling anxiety. I start feeling disappointment. And I move from being Christ-focused, Christ-centered to becoming me-centered. And I want Jesus to even become all about me. And I want my family to become all about me. And I want everything to become all about me because I have a genuine frailty, a genuine need. Friends, Paul speaks of his frailty, but he doesn't speak it of a way that, that attracts, attracts attention to himself. Simply, he speaks of it, as, uh, he owns it and acknowledges 
his frailty. We don't defeat anything by denying it, but we defeat everything by confessing it and not hiding it. And when we confess our frailty, we're not confessing our frailty as if they're, they're sins. We're confessing our frailty. We're admitting it. We're, we're speaking of it. I've been learning this so much over the past few years, even over the past few months. I'm only really starting to be able to talk with with people close to me, people like, like Megan, about, about things that are frailties in me, things that are insecurities and hurts, deep things in me. Now Paul, Paul recognizes his frailty and his own emotions and, and we do need to too. How are you doing, Paul? Oh, no, I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. I'm writing you this letter just to say thanks for Epaphroditus, but really no need, guys. I'm on top of things and all things are going well with me. I don't really need any help in anything. No, that's not what Paul says. He says, I'm sending him to you because despite the condition I'm in, I'll be even worse if he dies here with me. I long to see you. I wish I wasn't stuck here. I hate that I am stuck here. Ugh. Paul is writing real, real life, real <laughs> truth. But he wasn't someone who claimed to be free from his emotions and, and, and free from weak emotions, anger, frustration, disappointment, sadness, worry. Like Paul, we do well not to hide these emotions. Frailty, my friends. We do well to recognize them so that when they rise, we won't let them uh, give us, we won't give them power. But there's something else in acknowledging our frailty that I alluded to just now. Something else about acknowledging our frailty that's amazing. Uh, it helps us, acknowledging our frailty helps us to empathetically recognize the frailty in other people. Paul doesn't just look at Epaphroditus who is, has been sick and say, cheapest guys, this guy, what's up with him? And you send me this frail weakling who, who, who just can't make it. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't look at Epaphroditus and say, come on, man, you, you've been such a burden to me. Why don't you just, why don't you just go home? You, 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 you just haven't shown any strength at all. I mean, look at me. I've been in prison. I've been in jail. I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been all these things. And really, Epaphroditus, you just need to, you, you just need to man up a little bit more. You need to suck it up a little bit more. He doesn't, he doesn't do that. This man, Paul, who acknowledges his own frailties, his own tendencies and abilities to become anxious, fearful, frustrated, sad, uh, also seems to, because of that, understand where Epaphroditus is at. And he doesn't judge him for it. Paul would have had a lot of ammo to compare his life with Epaphroditus, but he doesn't do it. He knows that he himself is not the full package. So he doesn't say in order to be someone who is involved in extending God's kingdom, in order to be on my team, you have to live like I live and you have to be as strong as I am or as you think I am. Paul doesn't do that at all. Incidentally, importantly, Jesus doesn't do that either. He doesn't do that either. What you get when you really start to follow Jesus is Jesus. When you start to follow Jesus of the Bible, the, the, the Jesus that the Bible describes, you get Jesus. You don't just get the highlights package, Jesus. You get the Jesus who was really human, learning obedience under his parents. You get the Jesus who was dealing with hunger, dealing with loneliness, dealing with rejection, needing to constantly go to the Father in prayer. You get that Jesus too. You get the Jesus who was feeling fear and even anger and frustration at different times. If we follow Jesus, friends, we don't get a list of rules. We get a real man who who comes into our lives and leads us and allows us to be real men and women too. So if we follow Jesus, we live differently. If we follow the highlights package Jesus, or if we follow religious Jesus, or if we follow legalistic Jesus, the Jesus that we have to measure up to, well, well then we live differently too. That the Jesus that, 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 that God is calling us to live and, and be like, the Jesus that scripture has, holds up as the ultimate hero Jesus is the Jesus of scripture who was real, who had frailties and who, 
who struggled with various things. And his disciples did too. And the Bible's super, super honest about that. And his honesty of the scripture is supposed to help you and I to be honest with ourselves and to be honest with others. And it's to set us free so that we're not burdened by our frailties, so that we're not, we're not disillusioned by our frailties, so that we're not, we're, we're not hindered by our frailties, but rather we, we invite Jesus into them and we say, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Frailty is no longer a weakness. When we follow Jesus, we realize that frailty is simply a human condition, a condition Jesus himself experienced. Jesus saw frailty in others, but Jesus didn't reject them. And so Paul imitates this. Paul doesn't reject the frail either. He doesn't reject. Jesus saw the woman at the well. Jesus saw the tax, tax collectors. Jesus saw the lowly and the weak. Jesus saw the, the Samaritan people and he embraced them. The, the, the family that couldn't afford the wine for the wedding and didn't have enough and were going to be embarrassed and ashamed. Jesus didn't just didn't turn around and say, cheapest, you know, you really need to count the cost before you start something. It's on you guys. What you begin, you have to finish. No, Jesus came in and turned water into wine and allowed them to have honor and allowed them to, to be seen and seen honorably by people. And Paul does the same thing here. Friends, the people who lived as if they were never weak and only strong were the people that Jesus rebuked the most. They were the Pharisees, the religious people, the people who lived as if they were, 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 were bulletproof and, and strong all the time and who, who criticized and, and ridiculed and diminished people for not living up to their standard. The people who lived on the outside like they were perfect, but on the inside were broken like everybody else. Those were the people Jesus rebuked. Jesus said, you, you guys are no standard, no standard to live by. And he gave us a different standard, a new standard. And he, he called to himself a whole bunch of disciples of broken and, 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 and imperfect people. And he said, I want these guys to be your examples. Frailty, friends, is something that we can embrace. Frailty is something that we can acknowledge. Frailty is something that if we acknowledge it in ourselves, we'll acknowledge it in others and we won't put anybody down. We'll realize we're different. We have different capacities. We have different abilities. We have different uh, 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 strengths and, uh, and we will live honoring rather than ridiculing. And, and we see that just so beautifully in Paul. Friends, don't be like religious people. Be like Paul. Be like Jesus. The gospel advances. The church is attractive when it's full of real people. People who, like Jesus, understand the weakness of humanity. Jesus who entered into the frailty of human flesh and emotions and who understands ours will be like him who realize our own weaknesses and humanities of the flesh, uh, humanity and weakness of the flesh, and we will understand others. Frailty. People are different. They feel differently. They have different capacity and they respond differently. And so Paul wasn't exasperated by, by Epaphroditus and he didn't shame him. He went to great lengths to tell the church who he was and he went to great lengths to encourage the church to, to receive him. Paul is making sure that Epaphroditus is received with honor. He makes sure that there's no sense of failure in his returning. He has served and fought well, the church that Jesus is building is humble, adaptable, and it acknowledges its own and each other's frailties. This is the community of people uh, that people long to be a part of, a forgiving community, a generous, embracing community, an encouraging community, a community focused on the advance of the gospel, but one that also acknowledges the individual and their individual needs. A community that realizes this doesn't slow the advance of the gospel, but r rather living like this speeds it on. It hurries it. It takes it forward. We read of the church in Acts that they grew in favor with God and with man. And when man look in to a church of real people, they love that. And when we live in a church of real people, we love that. And we live like we love it. And so we live e extravagantly and, 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 and to the glory of Jesus. And Jesus is glorified. Our worship is our life. Our worship is the joy we live our lives in. 
How do we honor Paul and Epaphroditus and Timothy and the Philippian church? How do we honor Jesus? Friends, we honor them by looking like them. Not only in their strengths and on their good days as if that was all there was, but also in their humility and in their frailty and in their adaptability. So let's pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit to magnify Jesus to us so that we see him for who he really is. So that we end up living lives that are honest and actually like him. Christian lives, Christ-like lives. In doing that, we honor and we worship him and we bring glory to him. And then we bring glory to, the, to and, and we honor the, the way that Timothy, Paul and Epaphroditus and countless other followers of Jesus lived. Friend, you are loved and you are valuable and you are precious and you matter to God and to us. Be bold and very courageous. Know that you can risk your whole life for Jesus. He's got you. He's got you. And that thing that you're considering doing, I want to encourage you, go with or do what is in your heart to do. See Jesus, hear him calling to you and step out of the boat and move towards him. Live your life, live a life of extravagant faith that says, I believe that God's going to do this or do that. But even if he doesn't, I'm going to give my life to him. I'm going to give my life to the journey. I believe that I'm going to push through this season. But even if I don't, I'm going to continue giving my life to him. I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I feel anxiety and I feel shame and I feel pain and I feel fear like everybody else does. And so I'm going to I'm going to see other people living in pain and shame and anxiety and fear. And I'm not going to I'm not going to ridicule and, and look down on them. I'm going to lift them up. They are, we are champions. You are soldiers. You are brothers. You are family. You are wor fellow workers in the gospel. And I want to just say, God bless you. God bless you for who you are. God bless you for the way that you are serving Jesus. God bless you for the way you're pursuing the work of the Spirit, that you're going to the Word of God and allowing for the Word of God to become alive in your life. You're being challenged by it. You're being strengthened by it. By it and you're being equipped for it. Well done. And God bless you as you do that. I long to be with you. I long to spend time with you. I long to share stories. And we don't have to wait to be together to share stories. So send some emails, send some WhatsApp, send some, some, let's connect a little bit on social media now if we can. Put some comments on YouTube and Facebook, wherever you're watching this. Let's talk a little bit. Let's in interact a little bit. Have some conversations with your friends and family. Ask these questions. What are my frailties? Am I honest about them with myself and others? And am I inclined to judge other people by their frailties? Number two, how adaptable am I? Am I adaptable? What is there that I will not do? What is it that, that I just, what's, what's just a bridge too far for me? Or, or am I adaptable to, to do and go and say and be whatever Jesus wants me to be? Paul said, I, I, I become all things to all people if by chance I could just save one or win one. And then the last question, where would I need to learn humility in order to release me to, to, to reach certain people or to go to, cert, to do certain things? What's, what, what, is humility, what is pride keeping me away from and where do I need to learn humility? humility? God bless you, City Lights. God bless you, friends of City Lights. I long to be with you. I look forward to it. We'll be together again soon. But in the meantime, God is with you and we are not far. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.